Uh, it's Easter morning, or uh, actually, actually, it's the Feast of First Fruits in the Jewish holiday, uh, their, their cycle of holidays and holy days. The Feast of First Fruits uh, always came on the day after the Sabbath during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And if you've never heard of any of those, we're not going to go into a big thing about that. But it was always on a Sunday because the Feast of First Fruits that was initiated you know, 1,400 years before Jesus Christ, was looking forward to the time when the Lord and Savior, the Messiah of Israel, and the Savior of the world would be raised from the dead. That's why, you know, every Sunday morning we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Actually, we ought to celebrate it every day. Because everything I need to live, everything I need to be who God wants me to be, I find at the cross. His death, burial, and resurrection is why we're here. It's the foundation of the Christian faith. And uh, so we take this one day of the year uh, to focus on that, but it's every day ought to be a celebration of new life in Christ. Amen? Uh, if you have your Bibles this morning, we're just going to read a little bit, and we're not going to keep you for a real long time. They always say that. Some of the preacher always says that. But we won't keep you past 3 o'clock. No, we, not that long. Uh, not that long. And we're going to turn to the, uh, Paul's letter to the church at Corinth, 1 Corinthians. I always like to say it like that because a lot of, sometimes people don't know when you talk about the Bible, they think it's some kind of, you know, mysterious writing, holy writing. All it is, it was letters, you know, it's letters that the apostles sent to churches to explain things. It's not a mystery. It's nothing hidden. God wants us to understand. He doesn't want us to be in the dark. People say God, God is, works in mysterious ways. He doesn't. He lets us know what he does and lets us know what he did and lets us know what we can expect. You know, I like to know what to expect, right? I mean, uh, he doesn't tell us every little thing was going to happen tomorrow, every day, hour by hour, but he does let us know that there's a hope that we have that goes beyond this life. You know, one of the things, one of the, the scariest things, the scariest, one of the heaviest things that we deal with is death. You know, uh, I know that my age, <clears throat> where I am right now, I know that I have less years in front of me than behind me. How many people can say, that's a, say boy, that's, not, that's nothing to rejoice about, huh? That's, I came to church to have a good time, not to be bummed out, you know. But I'm finding some things out that, you know, when the older you get, and I know a lot of you, there's a few of you who are older than me, and a lot who are younger, you find out the older you get, you change your perspective on things. I don't think anywhere, when I was 21 years old, I thought a whole different way than what I think right now. Because that was 30-some years ago. And the older we get, the closer we get to that time where we know our time is going to come, unless Jesus comes back first. And I'm finding out I'm not so concerned about me that someday I'm going to die. Maybe tomorrow, maybe not for another who knows how many years. I don't know. God has not given me. He didn't give me a ticket for the time punch. And I'm not so concerned about that, but you know what really hurts is the thought of having to say goodbye to someone else. How many of you, many of you have had to do that? Have had to say goodbye. And it seems so final but I'm here to tell you it doesn't have to be final. Because the foundation of the Christian faith is the idea that everybody lives forever somewhere in a body. That's, a, that's called the resurrection. Everybody, when you were formed in your mother's womb, an individual human being with your personality and your makeup was born, was formed when those, you know, when a the genes came together and, and the, the cells started you know, multiplying and a little baby was formed in your womb. You were an individual. You will always be you for all of eternity. And you're going to live somewhere in a body. That's the teaching of the Christian faith. Now, when I was a kid, I was raised in a church. I was raised in church. And uh, we, they, made, they made us go to church every Sunday. And believe me, when I was a kid, they had to make me go to church every Sunday, okay? And uh, 
when I went to the church I went to, they taught us how to be good, you know, church members. But either they didn't teach or either I wasn't listening. I, I didn't understand why. You know, what? why do you go to church? Well, it's Sunday you go to church. So when I got older, and in my generation, we were like a generation that, you know, I guess every generation is like this, but we were the first one that had like media that ties together. We, we, you know, we, I start, we started to question and challenge anything that had authority written on it. How many people know what I'm talking about? You grew up in my era. So it was, you know, school, government, church, parents, whatever. It was like, I don't want none of that. So when I got old enough to tell my parents I wasn't going to church, I said, I ain't going to church. And they was, you know, they said, okay. So for a number of years, you know, maybe like a decade and a half or so, I, you know, I didn't want to church. I didn't. But every Easter and Christmas, I found myself wanting to go to church. And people would say, why are you going to church? I said, well, it's Easter. I said, well, what's Easter about? I said, I don't know, but it's Easter. Why are you going to church? It's Christmas. Well, do you, do you believe in God? I don't, I don't even believe in God, but it's Christmas. Go to church on Easter and Christmas. And I never knew why. And when I got saved, I got born again and saved. I was about 29, 30 years old. I found out why. And after I found out why, not only did I want to go on Easter and Christmas, I wanted to come all the time. When I found out why, People get together in a building like this, sometimes real big buildings, small buildings. Sometimes there'll just be a handful, sometimes there'll be a thousand of them. Why we get together on a Sunday morning? When I found out why, I said, wow, I want to do that. Because when we come together like this, we worship the God that promised me eternal life. I come here, now I can be at home and worship God, but it's so much nicer. He wants us to get together corporately and say thank you. For doing something for me. Thank you for providing a way that I don't have to spend my eternity in a lake of fire in my body that won't be consumed. Okay, now, I'm, I guess I'm getting ahead of myself. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. This is, this is the, uh, this is called the resurrection chapter. It's one of those chapters that if you want to read the Bible and learn about Christianity, this is a good one to really kind of focus on. There's some places in the Bible that are kind of obscure, and, but this one here, it's, it's, a, it's, it's an important one. Listen to what the Apostle Paul, who wrote this letter to the Church of Corinth, he wanted to explain to them about resurrection. He wanted them to understand what, what this thing is all about. And he says this, in chapter 15 and verse 1, he says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received and wherein you stand. The gospel, that word means good news. Good news. By which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. You might say, saved from what? What I get saved from? Saved from the punishment that I'm due because of my sin. Okay, see, when I was born, I was a born sinner. I was a sinner. And when I was born a sinner, and I got old enough, I recognized I needed, I needed a remedy for that sin. The wages of sin is death. The reason why people die is because of sin. When Adam and Eve sinned, that brought death into the world. And, and people die, okay? So, I got this problem. I'm going to die. What am I going to do about it? Try to find a fountain of youth. Try to find, you know, drink, you know, take vitamins. Drink, uh, you know, fruit juice, or whatever, okay? Okay. Look at verse 3. Paul says this. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that, what? Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. Christ died for our sins, How? According to the scriptures, according to what's written. Jesus wasn't some guy that came here and had, uh, you know, something bad happened to him and he had a plan and it didn't go right. Some folks think, well, you know, he had this plan and it fell through and they ended up crucifying him. It was determined before the foundations of the earth that God would provide a remedy for the death problem. And the remedy that he would provide 
would be his only begotten son, the son of God, the eternal son of God, the second person of the Godhead, coming to this earth, taking on flesh like us, living a sinless life, but dying a sinner's death. When Jesus was hanging on that cross, we talked about this Friday night. He was there as a sinner, but he was not a sinner. He was the spotless lamb of God. He was the Passover lamb. He was the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. He said, Jesus died for our sins according to the scriptures. If you go back to Isaiah chapter 53, we read it Friday evening. He was bruised for our iniquities, a chastisement of our peace is upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. Okay, 750 years before it happened, the prophet saw the suffering Savior. And listen to what he says in verse 4. And that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, how? According to the Scriptures. See, if Jesus just had died and been buried, he would have been a martyr. But he wouldn't have any power to do anything for me. A lot of good people have martyred themselves and died good. There have been Christian martyrs. There have been people who have given their lives for good causes. But once they're dead... They can't do anything for me because anybody else other than Christ, they're just as big a sinner as I am. Their blood was tainted with sin just like mine is. They couldn't pay the price for my sin. They couldn't pay the price for their own sin. Only this God-man, Jesus Christ, who was fully God and fully man, was able to pay the price. So according to the scriptures, God made a way for his fallen creation. For this, this creature named man, human beings, that he created in his image. Only Christ could pay the price for my sin. And only he had the power to get up out the grave. You know what? When, I, when they bury me, I'm going to stay there until the resurrection. Now, my spirit will go to be with the Lord. The Bible says, absent from the body, present with the Lord. But when, if I die before Jesus comes back and they put my body in the ground, you know what? It's going to stay there. It's not getting up for nothing until Jesus says, get up. And that time is coming. This is why do we celebrate the resurrection? Why do we, why do we celebrate Christ? Why do we come to church on the Sunday? What is the reason? Because he made a way for me not to have to be worried about dying. Now, the Apostle Paul that wrote this letter, and we're going to come back here in a minute, but he, he said some other things. Now, I want you, I want you to turn with me. Uh, a couple books behind Corinthians, there's a book called Philippians, a letter called Philippians. And uh, turn there with me. I just want to look at a couple passages, and I, I promise I'm not going to keep you real long. Uh, Philippians chapter 1. I, I want you, see, my heart has always been, and you folks that come to this church all the time, know that my heart is when somebody walks into the church, when they walk out, they'll have something they didn't have when they came in. And I'm not talking about, you know, a bulletin, okay? I'm to, I'm, they'll, they'll either understand something or they'll have something that they, that they, they, that they didn't have when they came in, okay? So I, I hope, I, I want to equip you and, and hopefully teach you what it means to be a Christian, what the hope that we have. Now, now look, what, look at what, again, the Apostle Paul in chapter 1 of Philippians. And, and we're going to look at verse... 21, and for time's sake, we could read up to this. But, you know, Paul was talking about, uh, when, when he wrote this letter of Philippians, he was in jail. He was imprisoned. Not because he had done anything wrong, but because he had preached the gospel. So Paul was in, Paul was in prison, and he's writing these, these letters to the churches. And, and he was telling them, listen, I know you guys are concerned about me being here. And, and, you know, and, and Paul, for all he knew, he could have ended up with his head chopped off because back then they didn't have parole boards. They didn't have appeals. You know, Nero, he was waiting to appear before Nero, and he was crazy. So as far as Paul knew, when he appeared before Nero, uh, he could have ended up, you know, headless. So you know, he didn't know what the future was holding, but he knew this. He said in verse 21, he says, I don't care if I live or if I die. As long as I'm alive, I can be useful to, to Christ. And is, if I'm dead, well, hey, I go to heaven. And he says this in verse 21. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Now, how many of us, and I'm talking to, you know, if you're a believer, 
if you're not a believer, then it really kind of doesn't count. But if you're a believer, you know, we, we want to live. Because as long as we're alive, we can be useful to the, to the master. We can witness. We can pray. We can reach out. We can, we can do things in the name of Jesus to live as Christ. But you know what? When we die, I get to go to heaven. Hey, it's like I can't lose. In fact, sometimes, and, and let's face it, if you're honest with yourself, there's sometimes you almost wish you could get there a little quicker. Come on, things can get tough down here. Remember, if you go in the Old Testament and read Job, how many people ever read Job? Probably the oldest book in the, in the Old Testament. Job goes back years and years and years. And even back then, and Job was going through a horrible time. And he said, I know my Redeemer lives. And I'll see him someday standing on the circle of the earth. See, even he knew there was hope. Even everything he was going through, he knew there was a hope beyond the grave that we're taught about right here. Paul says, for me to live is Christ. I like living. It's all right. <laughs> you know, I like living. But when that time comes and my name is called, I'm going to go be with him. Wow. And, 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 and someday in the future, there's, there's going to be what they call the resurrection of the dead. Oh, well, we'll get to that later. Okay. <laughs> That's, I don't want to get ahead of myself. Turn Now, in the same book, Philippians, turn over to chapter 3. <clears throat> and and uh, we're going to start with verse 4. Now, again, this is the Apostle Paul writing this letter to the church in a city called Philippi. And if you know anything about the history of the Apostle Paul, if you read the book of Acts, he was... He had been a Jewish rabbi. He was a member of the Sanhedrin. His name was, was originally Saul. And do you know that Saul hated Christ? If you go back to the book of Acts, he hated Christ. And he hated Christians. In fact, he went out to try to round them up and throw them in jail. Because he thought the Christians were a threat. The, all the early Christians were Jews, okay? So he thought that these Jews that had gone away from what he thought was Ju Judaism, he was going to round them up and throw them all in jail because he considered them a threat to his religion. So he was, man, he was zealous. He was on his way to Damascus with a bunch of bench warrants to, to wrap up all these Christians that were up there and drag them back to Jerusalem and throw them in jail. And he ended up meeting... Jesus Christ face to face. This is the resurrected Christ now. So after Christ's crucifixion. And here's what Paul said. Look at, he was talking about those people that think their religion is going to save them. Now, you know, I don't want anybody to get mad at me. But you know what? You talk about your religion. Let me tell you something. Your religion is not worth a hill of beans. My, if I have religion, I don't want to be religious. When I first got saved, people said, well, he got religion. I said, no, I didn't get religion. I got rid of my religion. I had religion before. Now, listen, Paul had, man, Paul had religion. Listen to what he says. Verse 4 of uh, Philippians chapter 3, he says this. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinks that he has whereof he might trust in the flesh, I am more. Paul said, man, if, if God was going to judge us according to our good works, I was right up there, first in line. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews is touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. He said, man, I had it all gone. I had the right clothes. I had the right hat. I was doing the right things according to what they told me uh, I should. I was trying to keep the law. I was blameless. Man, I was, I was careful not to do anything that was against the law that was written in the Old Testament. He said, if anybody had anything to boast about, boy, you could look at me and say, boy, there's a guy that's going to heaven right now. But he said, listen to what he says. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. He had power. He had position. He had the respect of all the people around him because he was Saul the Pharisee. And he said, all that stuff that used to be important to me, when I came face to face with Jesus Christ on that road to Damascus, all that stuff that I thought was important to me, you know what it became? It became rubbish. Rubbish. Listen to what he says. Verse 8. And doubtless I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, 
For whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. And be found in him, not having my own righteousness. Boy, I, I hope God's not going to judge me on my righteousness. Because if he does, I'm, 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 I'm gone. And you too. I hope he's not found in him having my own righteousness, which is of the law. But that which is through faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. I look, verse 10. I read all that to get to verse 10. Somebody says, why didn't you just read verse 10? Well, I had to read up to that. Okay. That I may know him. How many people want to know Jesus? I didn't want to know Jesus. You know, when I was younger, I didn't want to know Jesus. I heard about him. Yeah, Jesus. And, you know, I knew, okay, he was probably a good guy, but I figured that church thing was just power and authority and people trying to control other people. I don't know. But Paul said that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto death. We like that power of his resurrection thing, but we come to that suffering thing and we say, well, I don't know. But you see, the, the, the fellowship of his sufferings, that's, that's Good Friday. That's the crucifixion. The fellowship of his sufferings is living this life consecrated unto him, dead to, to, dead to flesh and alive to Jesus Christ, allowing him to sanctify us and help us grow and help us be the people we're supposed to be uh, as Christians. You know God really would like you to, to live your life according to what his word says. There's a whole lot of folks that sit up and have been sitting up in church for 30, 40 years that don't really care what his word says. Worry about the Ten Commandment plaque down there at the uh, school down there. Half the people screaming about that doesn't even know what it says. The other half doesn't care. But Paul says, I want to know him in the fellowship of his suffering. That means as we live our life in this planet, to live is Christ. As I live, I'm crucified with Christ, therefore I no longer live. I want to live a life that's poured out to him. That means I'm going to have to, have to suffer the loss of some things I used to count dear to me. Things I used to think were important. Things I used to think were prestigious. Things I used to think were, you know, made me look like. Somebody, I have to give all that up. Pride, stuff that I would think, you know, would make me. Paul said, that's a fellowship of his suffering. But listen, here's the good part. The fellowship of his sufferings and the power of his resurrection. Why do we come to church on Sunday? Not just on Easter, but every Sunday. Why do we worship God? Why, why are we thankful to God? Why? Because Jesus Christ suffered, yes. was buried, and raised again yes. according to the scriptures. And if we were created in the image of God, and you were, you might, not, you might not act like it or look like it, but every one of us in this room, every human being in this room, we were created in the image of God. We have a body, we have a soul, and we have a spirit. Created in his image. When you were formed in your mother's womb, you were created in the image of God. That's why we can say, because he lives, we can live too. Okay, now, I, I just wanted to set that up. I want you to go back now with me to 1 Corinthians. And we're going we're to read through chapter 15 kind of quickly. But I really want to get to the end of it. And we'll probably skip over a few things. Back in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and we left off at verse 4. Let's start at verse 5. Paul, Paul talks about the times that Jesus was seen after his death, burial, and resurrection. Because after Jesus was resurrected from the dead, three days after his crucifixion, he was resurrected from the dead. He hung around for 40 days with his disciples, teaching them and so forth, and then he, was, then he ascended into heaven, okay? Now listen to what he said. He was seen of Cephas, which is Peter, another name for Peter, then of the twelve. After that, he was seen of about 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present day, but some have fallen asleep. After that, he was seen of James, then all of the apostles, and last of all, he was seen of me as one born out of due time. Paul's saying, listen, there are, there are testimonies 
People who saw the resurrected Christ, because we all know, and again, you read the Gospels, when they found the empty tomb after three days, they tried to say, well, you know, somebody snuck in there and stole them. And even though they had, a, they had a Roman guard in front of that, they paid them off and they said, well, tell them you fell asleep. You know, and I mean, they, I mean, they tried to cover that thing up as much as they could. They tried to explain the, 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 the empty tomb away. They said, well, Jesus really didn't really die. He just kind of passed out, uh, even though he had a spear stuck in his side and nails in his hands and feet. And, you know, and, uh, or else it was somebody else up there and Jesus really just kind of like they substituted something. They came up with all these, all these ideas. But it was Christ and he was resurrected and the tomb was empty. And, and Paul is saying, listen, the people saw him after that. All these people. He says in verse 10, But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was in me. Therefore, whether it were I or they, so we preach, and you so believe. He's saying, listen, we, we preach to you this resurrected Christ. You know, I, I really believe a great problem we have today, especially in the church, especially in this nation, is we're preaching everything but a resurrected Christ. Amen. We're preaching, you know, psychology. Well, if you're, you know, if you're being afflicted, it's like, you know, watch Dr. Phil, right? Okay. We're preaching, we're preaching uh, you know, self-help, 12-step. You got an addiction? Go, you know, go to 12-step. Rehab. We're preaching everything but the power of God. You know something I found out? God can make you an ex-alcoholic. He can make you an ex-drug addict. See, he won't make you, he won't make you a recovering alcoholic. See, that's what, that's what all them programs, you're recovering, I'm recovering. See, as long as you're recovering, then you're under their, you know, <laughs> then you have to keep going to the meetings, you know. But God can make you an ex alcoholic. I don't need the meetings no more. God can make you an ex-liar. God can make you an, well, now we're getting personal because there's some folks that say, I never smoked a, smoked a joint in my life. But man, if you ever told a lie, God can make you an ex-liar. He can make you an ex-gossiper. He can make you an ex-adulterer. Huh? He can take whatever you are in your sin and set you free. And you'll be free indeed. That's the power of the resurrection. That's the power of God. That's why we celebrate the risen Christ. Because if he wasn't risen, he couldn't do that for me. Okay. Reading on, let's, let's just drop down. Uh, just drop down a little bit because if we read through the whole chapter, we'll be here. Uh, look, look at verse. Uh, look, look at verse. Uh, 17. Now, now Paul was addressing, because some people were, were claiming that Jesus Christ hadn't risen from the dead, okay? And he was addressing this to this church, and he said in verse 17, and again, I'm skipping over some just for time's sake. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, you are yet in your sins. If Jesus Christ is not alive, I should be home sleeping in. I could be home watching the reruns of the Penguins game. You know, I mean, if, if Jesus Christ isn't alive, this is a waste of time. See, that's, that's, that's what I thought when I was growing up, because I didn't understand this. The way you go to church on Sunday, it's a waste of time. You go to church, smell incense, sing some songs. The, look at verse 18. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. Verse 19. If in this life only, if this is it, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most what? If this is it, if, 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 if I live and die and that's it, what's the sense? But there's a hope that goes beyond. He says this. But now, in verse 20, is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits? Remember, I said this was the festival of first fruits in the Jewish calendar. The first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as an Adam, remember him? Adam, the first man, created in God's image, placed in the garden. He had everything at his beck and call. God gave him a wife, beautiful wife, probably beautiful, I would imagine. And they were in the garden, and they had everything. 
And they were naked and weren't ashamed. And everything was fine. Until the tempter came. And he didn't go to Adam first. You notice that? He went to Eve. And he said, hey, this is in Genesis chapter 3. You can read it. He said, did God say you couldn't eat of that tree? Remember, God gave Adam one commandment. He gave him, he said, everything is yours. I'm just reserving this one tree for myself. And it doesn't matter what kind of tree it was. Sometimes it was an apple tree. It doesn't matter. It, it's really not. It was just a tree. But God said, he, he said, I'm reserving to, to, to show you that I'm God and you're not. I'm reserving one thing for myself. Don't eat of this tree. Everything else is yours. You got everything. Name the animals, you know, the whole thing. Don't you know the serpent came to Eve and said, did God say you couldn't eat of that tree? Come on, you don't believe what God says, do you? Same thing. He's the same liar he was back then. You don't, you don't believe God. God, God, God that's just, they're just trying to control you. Come on, you ever hear that? Did you ever think that? They're just trying to control you. Eve said, God said we shouldn't eat of that tree. Satan said, nah, God's a liar. Go ahead. Eat a tree. God knows that when you eat of that tree, you're going to be just like him. Eve ate, gave it to her husband, Adam. And they looked at themselves and they said, wow, we're naked. Up until that time, they didn't know. But when their eyes were open, and what had to happen? God had to put them out of the garden because flesh and blood can't inherit the kingdom of God. Sinful flesh can't be there. So he put them out of the garden. And you know what he did for them? He killed an animal and took the skins. He shed blood and covered them so their nakedness would be covered. All a picture of what he was going to do with his son, Jesus Christ. Listen to what it says. For as an Adam, all die. Everybody's going to die. Even so, in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ, the first fruits, the feast of first fruits, afterward they are Christ at his coming. Then comes the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and authority and power. For he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Now, I'm going to give you some facts about resurrection. I've said a lot of things this morning, and some of these things you might remember. Some of them you might forget. You might forget all of them. But if you're going to, if you're going to remember anything, remember this. When the, the thing that sets Christianity like apart from other world religions, okay? It's our belief in a resurrected Savior and our belief in that all will be resurrected, okay? Now, listen. The idea of a resurrected Savior and the idea of a bodily resurrection is exclusively Christian. If you look at other lines, if you look at Buddhism, you look at Hinduism, you look at even Islam, they believe in a kind of resurrection, but it's not quite the same thing. We're the only ones that say we have a God who came, became one of us, died, and was resurrected again. It's, nobody else has that. Number two, the belief in resurrection militates against every other belief about life after death. In other words, you know, some people believe that if you die, you know, they, they, they believe in like the karma thing. If you die and you live the, you know, a good life, you'll come back like the next step up. Or if you didn't do well, you'll, you'll have to go back and do it over again. And you'll be re, you know, uh, reincarnated as an animal or as Uncle George or something. You'll come back as you know, like a fly or an, uh, whatever. They'll, they believe you'll come back as something else. That, that, that and, and resurrection can't be true. One has to be true and one has to be false. Because resurrection teaches that you're going to rise from the dead as you. You will always, Carol will always be Carol. You'll never be Betty. Okay? You, whoever you are, your personality, if you don't like yourself now, you might as well get used to yourself because you're going to be with yourself for a long time. For eternity. Okay? Now. Militates against all other folks. And finally, the resurrection pertains to all people, good and bad. Everybody is going to live forever somewhere in a body. Jesus talked about it in John chapter 5, uh, when he talked about, you know, the dead will, will rise. 
Let's read it. John's Gospel, let's just turn there. You know, uh, the ham ain't going to burn. We'll be all right. John's, John's Gospel in chapter 5. And, 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 and look what he says. In verse, uh, I, think, I think 24. Okay. Look at John chapter 5 and verse 24. <laughs> Verily, verily, I say unto you, this is Jesus talking. If you have a Bible with red letters, these are red letters. This is his voice. I say unto you, he that hears my word and believes on him that sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Verse 25. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. For as the Father has life in himself, so has he given to the Son to have life in himself, and has given him authority to execute judgment also because of the Son of Man. Okay, he was talking about Jesus was here, he was speaking, there were people hearing his voice and responding and receiving life. Okay, now look what he says. Marvel not at this in verse 28, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the graves, all that are in the graves, all shall hear. His voice. It says over in 1 Thessalonians, the trump of God will sound and the dead will rise. The same voice that said, Lazarus, come forth, will call. And all will hear his voice. All. Can you say all? Are you part of all? Okay, okay, we're all. Which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice, verse 29, and shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of... Everybody, good and bad, is going to be raised from the dead. And here's, here's the scenario, and I'm closing. And we always, we always go through this every, every Easter. Because sometimes we forget why we come here. There's going to come a time where it says the trump of God will sound and the dead in Christ shall be raised incorruptible. That means that when a body is put in a tomb, in, in a grave, and maybe it had cancer or a bad heart or whatever, when it comes up again, it's not going to have that anymore. Somebody will say, what am I going to look like? I don't know, but probably a whole lot better than I look right now. <laughs> I'm not going to have to worry about the calories. <laughs> okay. You're going to the why. Um, we don't know. We don't know what age you're going to be. We don't know, you know, I guess I'm not going to have gray hair. I don't know. But the dead in Christ shall rise, and we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with us. It's called the rapture of the church. There's going to come the first resurrection where all those who ever lived and put their faith and trust in, in God and, and was saved by faith, their bodies are going to raise up from the dead, and they're going to be reunited with their spirits and be with the Lord forever. Amen? There's going to come another resurrection where the voice is going to sound. And those who had died out of Christ. Their body is going to be raised again too. It's not going to be such a good thing. You can read about that in Revelation chapter 19. It's called the great white throne judgment. And all those who are raised at that judgment, they're going to, their bodies are going to come up out of the grave too. Perfect, uh, you know, incorruptible. And they're going to stand before the judge. Anybody here ever have to stand before a judge? On this, you, know, you don't want to put your hands up. <laughs> but, you know, I, I've, I've, I've been in courtrooms where people were standing before judges. I hope I never have to stand before an earthly judge. But the people that are in that resurrection are going to stand before the judge of the universe in their bodies. And they're going to stand before and and, and they're going to look, and the judge is going to say, look through the Lamb's book of life and see if their name is there. And they'll look through and they'll say, we don't see their name. So, okay, well, let's judge them out of their works. 
And the judge will end up saying, depart from me and be cast into a lake of fire. See, I used to think that was a lot of mythology. I thought that was folklore. I thought that was just people made that up to scare people, to control people. No, it's, it's made up as a warning. Everybody lives forever somewhere in their body, either in the presence of God, in a place called heaven, or in a lake of fire called hell. That's the teaching of God's word. I rejected it for many years. You can shrug it off and say, ah, that guy's just saying that stuff. He, just, he wants me to join his church. Ah, my church can't save you. Only the blood of Jesus can save you from your sins. Back to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and I promise you I'm closing. <laughs> I am, really. At the very end, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and look at, look at verse, we'll get to the very end of the chapter. Uh, it's starting at verse, if I find it. You, you can read chapter 11 because it talks about what resurrection is like and so forth, but look at verse 51, okay? And we're closing. Behold, the Apostle Paul says, I show you a mystery. Whenever you read in the New Testament about a mystery, it was something that had been hidden that is now revealed. I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. If Jesus Christ were to come back before I die, my body's going to be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Victory in Jesus. You see, my flesh and blood can't inherit the kingdom of God. This body I'm in right now, my spirit has been born again. I'm a new creature in Christ. I've been crucified with Christ, therefore I no longer live. But Jesus Christ now lives within me. But this flesh and blood that's getting old and wearing out and creaking around the joints, and it can't inherit the kingdom of God. If I were to enter into the kingdom of God in this flesh, I'd be consumed. I need a new body. You know what? It's coming. And the body I'm getting, it's going to be like the one Jesus had when he came out of the grave. And that's offered to all. Just finish reading this chapter. Death, where's your sting? Grave, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. See, that's why we come to church. I found out when I was about 29 years old, that's why people go to church. They never taught me that. Oh, maybe, maybe the church I was going to, maybe that's not why they were gone. I don't know. Maybe I wasn't listening. I don't know. But it took me 25, 29 years to get to the place where I finally realized what this Christian thing was all about. It's not about just like acting, you know, goofy. And some Christians know how to do that. <laughs> but but that, that's, not, that's not the point. It's about a hope that we have. That's why we worship the Lord in song. That's why we wave banners and, and say, wow, hallelujah. You know, like, like people go to baseball games and wave banners. What, what are they waving banners for them for? I want to wave a banner for my Lord. Amen. Steelers never did nothing for me. Never, never will, except take my money. But my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, went to the cross, was crucified, Buried and resurrected according to the scriptures. I hope you're happy about that this morning. I hope, I hope that you're able to say, I have that hope. I have that promise. It's mine. I don't deserve it. I didn't earn it. I can't buy it. But it's only through faith in the blood of Jesus Christ. I want to ask you this morning. I want you to ask you to stand with me, if you will. <clears throat> We're going to close and pray. But I want to encourage you this morning. I know most of y'all, there's a few folks here I, I haven't, I've never met before. I thank you for coming to our service this morning. 
But I want to say this. If you're not convinced, if you're not sure, if you don't know that if you were to die on your way out the door, you would end up in the presence of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. If you don't know that, I want you to know it. Yes. If you want to. Maybe you don't want that. Maybe, maybe you don't want to be there. That's okay. That's your choice. Just as long as you know. I hope that something you heard today will let you know, you know what the two sides are. Because you might, you might shrug your shoulder and say, man, I'm not interested in that. All right. Just as long as you know what the choice is. I'm going to pray. If you've never made Christ your Lord, or maybe if you had, or maybe you're not sure, or maybe you don't know, I want you to know one way or the other when you walk out this door. In Adam, all die. In Christ, all are made alive. Father, in the name of Jesus. We have spoke your word this morning. We have read from your scriptures this morning. Father, I, first of all, I want to thank you for the gift of life you have given us to all those who have put their faith in Jesus Christ. Now, Father, I pray for every person in this room, in this house this morning, that not a one of us would leave here without an understanding of who you are and what you did in your son, Jesus Christ. Father, I pray that you would call that you would, you would send your spirit, that you would draw us this morning to a place where we'll call out to you, Father, forgive me, I'm a sinner. Jesus, save me, I'm a sinner. Jesus, I want to live forever in your presence. I don't want to live in a lake of fire for all of eternity. Father, I want to be in your presence. I want the hope of glory, Christ in me. It's your word, and you've spoken, Lord, through your word clearly. That there is only one hope and only one way. Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody gets to the Father but through me. And the time is coming when the dead will hear my voice and will rise from the dead. Father, I pray for every individual in this room. I pray, Lord, that there would not be one person who would leave here not knowing you as their Savior. Lord, I pray there would not be one person in this room that would leave here not understanding what it means. Yes. Father, I thank you, and a personal prayer, Lord, I thank you that there were many times people witnessed to me and I rejected and I refused, but I've, when I finally understood you were gracious, you were long-suffering toward me, you put up with me for a decade and a half before I finally surrendered to the truth. Father, I pray that the power of God in this room, not my words, but your words, not my spirit, not the church of God, but the spirit, the Holy Spirit of the living God will convict us all where we're standing of our need for a Lord and Savior. And Father, I want to pray for those, there are those in this room that are praying for their loved ones. They're praying for children that aren't saved. They're praying for husbands and wives and, and aunts and uncles. And they're praying for people who aren't saved. Father, I pray, God, we need to see an outpouring of your spirit in these last days. Father, save our loved ones before it's too late. We thank you, Lord. We give you glory. I want to say this. We're going to sing a little song and close. If any of you here need prayer, if for the first time, in your life, you've asked Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior. Please don't leave until I can come pray. I go back and I shake a few hands, but then I come back in. Please stay here. If you need prayer for anything, please don't leave. That we might pray with you. That we might stand with you and agree. If you need prayer for healing, for anything, please don't leave until we can pray with you, okay? We're going to dismiss. Look to the Lord. Father, we thank you as we go from this place, but not your presence, Father. I pray that your spirit we reach down and touch each and every heart in this room. Father, we thank you and we give you glory. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus.